And there's another line that I'd like to show with you, a little category here, of Judah or Israel. In this case, Isaiah was primarily called to prophesy to the southern kingdom of Judah. And that is something to notice as we get into lesson number 18. The one-line content summary is that the prophet was sent to warn of future judgment and tells of the coming Messiah. That is something that can be said of all of them, but in particular, Isaiah was indeed a prophet that was mostly known for those two things. Half of the book says, here's a warning for the future. The second half was filled with heavy content about the Messiah. I've listed for you some key chapters to read. Unless you want to just read the entire book for about four hours, uh, then I encourage you to hit these key chapters, and it will help you tremendously. But I'm hoping that now that you're reading the chapters or the book after the class, uh, if there's a shift that happened for you along that line, then maybe that's a good thing, because Isaiah is so lengthy and, and so, so uh, uh, potentially confusing that if you don't look at a bigger, broader picture, like I'm going to show you later tonight, you'll get confused and wonder, what's he, what's he talking about here? Where are we at? So, we have here, just the categories of what we've already done. We have the Pentateuch, which is the beginning of sin, the call to Abraham, and the establishment of the Israelite people. And then from that point forward, once they were in the wilderness wanderings and entered the land of conquest, you have the history of the Jewish people. Uh, the history of the Hebrew people all the way down to where we are in the time of Christ. It was within the time of the monarch, however, that we had most of the Hebrew poetry written, mostly by King Solomon, as we mentioned before. But during the era of the Hebrew history, from Joshua to Esther, and at least in the chronology of the listed books there, you have the prophets. And one by one, sometimes grouped together, we're going to look at each of these prophets and see where they are in history. Isaiah is, of course, our focus tonight, and Isaiah focuses on Jesus Christ as the Lamb who was silently led to the slaughter, the Prince of Peace, wonderful Counselor, mighty God, wonderful, mighty God and Counselor. So, we will conclude our class by reading uh, chapter 53, and it's an appropriate conclusion to this. Appreciate Michael's work so that I can see this, and I'm thankful I have my glasses as it's sitting there so beautifully on the front pew, most appropriately placed. Thank you. That will help me a lot not get dizzy. So in this case, you have the period of the divided kingdom. Why did I highlight that? It's because this is when Isaiah was prophesying. And if you want to read the history of what's going on, you can read 1 Kings chapter 12 through 2 Kings chapter 17. Now some of this is overlapping now. We've already covered this. 2 Chronicles 10 through 28. He is, Isaiah, a contemporary of prophets like Obadiah, Joel, uh, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. But interesting how they all kind of go together over a course of 100 years, maybe 150 years of time. Well, in terms of uh, the flow of Scripture, I'm wondering right now if we have time for this. Uh, it's been a couple weeks since we've done this, so let's take two minutes and speedily then read the rest of the class as we focus on the content. But let's spend about two minutes on the Old Testament survey. Welcome to 3-Minute Bible Study on Biblical History. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God created man and woman. Creation was good. Then Adam and Eve rebelled and fell from God. Wickedness increased, and judgment came in the flood on all but Noah and those in the ark. Noah's descendants were dispersed at the Tower of Babel, and God chose Abram and his seed to receive the promised land, to become a nation, and to bless all nations. The promise continued through Abraham's son Isaac and his son Jacob, also known as Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, one of which would rise to the right hand of power in Egypt. The Israelites came down to live in Egypt, but later became enslaved for about 400 years. Through Moses, God delivered them and made a covenant with them at Sinai, where they received the law and instructions for the tabernacle. But being unfaithful, they were detained in the wilderness for 40 years, and the next generation took the promised land under Joshua. Judges then led the people until Samuel's day, when Saul was appointed the first king of Israel. After Saul's rejection, God chose David to be king and promised that his seed would be a son to God would build a house to God, and his kingdom would be established forever. David's immediate son Solomon did build the temple, but the promise of a kingdom forever would be part of the messianic hope in Israel. After Solomon's death, the nation divided into northern and southern kingdoms, both largely unfaithful and ignoring the prophets calling for repentance. As prophesied, both nations fell, Israel to Assyria in 722 BC and Judah to Babylon, along with the destruction of the temple in 586. 
After the Babylonian captivity, many returned to the land with Zerubbabel and Ezra and rebuilt the temple, followed by Nehemiah, who rebuilt the city walls. Amen. And it's during that divided kingdom that most of the prophets made their appearance. We have some key slides from the Look at the Book series, and in this case, the Know Your Bible series as well, that I'd like to share with you. Just some highlights from things that you can screenshot and read in full detail later. There is a key word in Isaiah. It says, salvation is the key word, salvation. This word appears 26 times, but only 7 times in all the other prophetic books. Isaiah is about salvation. We have a few key verses such as, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's a common phrase. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So those two are pretty key. The key phrase, and we'll mention it later way down there, is, O Holy One of Israel. I'll mention some details about that soon. Isaiah wrote of the glory of God and the salvation of man through Jesus Christ. He gives prophecies of both condemnation and consolation. The condemnation is because they are not turning and repenting like they should, but the consolation is, well, at least God will stay faithful to his covenant, and that's the essence of it all. Um, he focuses so much on Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, that he's known as the evangelical or messianic prophet. What's the appeal? The main purpose of Isaiah was to utter prophecies whose certain fulfillment proved the deity of God, the Messiahship of Jesus, and the full inspiration of the truthfulness of the Bible. And we see this in so many ways. I'll show you a list soon of several prophecies in Isaiah and the New Testament reference of their fulfillment. The book of Isaiah is a miniature Bible. It's called that because it contains 66 chapters, as mankind has divided it, with two main divisions. The content reveals this. And as you make comparisons to the Bible as a whole, it's amazing. It's actually quite interesting, the coincidental, uh, less than providential, but coincidental content of uh, the uh, div divisions there. But we have here the beginning of our class. So on your outline, and a little bit of a lengthy introduction, some things I'll mention from the sheet, some things I'll mention and add on, but I want to add a few notes as we begin there was a world-renowned skeptic who, in the early 1900s, stated, if I could believe that all of Isaiah was written by Isaiah when he lived, I would have no choice but to believe the entire Bible. Now, of course, the evidence is insurmountable, but he chose not to believe. The implication of his statement, though, is quite clear. Isaiah's prophecies are so precisely powerful that if they are authentic, they would have no way other than being divinely given. There's just no way that he could have known all the things that he said that came about were it not for God. And that is indeed the case. So, in our English Bible, you'll notice some details here about the word prophet, from the Greek word prophetes, who speaks for another. And that's translated from a Hebrew word which means to communicate the divine will. So, who is a prophet, biblically speaking, one who communicates for God. Uh, a person through whom God would speak. And there were a few exceptional men who had additional roles, such as Moses, who was also the leader of Israel, the Hebrew people. But uh, during the times of the kings, the prophets were not rulers. The prophets were primarily spokesmen for God. Not officials, not in the government, but they were just bold, spirited, godly men who challenged both the common man and kings alike to stay with the Lord and turn back to Him. Um, there was cases like Elijah, who um, had King Ahab and all the prophets of Baal gathered on Mount Carmel, and he addressed all the people and gave them an ultimatum and said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. How long will it you waver and waffle between two opinions? Choose today. And of course, he was about to give a demonstration of what the right choice would be. But the prophets prior to 850 B.C., in the academic world, are just known for not being ones who wrote. They, they, they didn't give themselves to writing. Now, even though some of them wrote, like Moses, he wrote a lot. Samuel wrote a lot of 1 Samuel. But for the most part, they weren't known as writing. They were known as the non-writing prophets, at least in academia, because they didn't give themselves to writing and collecting their books and preserving them. They didn't do that. Um, but 
some of them did. The 17 plus prophets after AD, uh, 850 BC did write their words, and we have them today. They were known as the writing prophets. Five of these 17 were written by the um, major prophets. We say the major, the four major ones. They have five books because of Jeremiah's lament. So you have Isaiah, which is one of them, Jeremiah, his lament, Ezekiel, and Daniel. We mention them as major just because they're so lengthy and heavy in content. But the distinction between major and minor is not in terms of importance. It's strictly in terms of their length. Uh, the length of books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, they are just as inspired, just as significant and important for the world to hear as Joel, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and others. Uh, they were all actually, the smaller ones, kept on one scroll. So in the time of Jesus, if you were to refer to the 12 in terms of writing, you would be talking about the minor, uh, what we would say is the minor prophets. That's interesting to know about. Similar to our recent restoration movement, the prophets were calling people to call, uh, get their ways back into the Lord. If the Lord has a way, we need to get back to it. The restoration of God's way. And simultaneously, they were also directing people's attention forward to the Messiah that would come. I love the era of the prophets, and I love what they were all about. The more we study them, I think the more you will appreciate them. So we were just now beginning this whole new category and genre of literature. Uh, we'll see that uh, in Isaiah, in the way that he demonstratively called people to repentance, he focused their eyes as well on the suffering servant, the one that he called the suffering servant. And who is that? And who is it going to be? Well, under the name of the book... It's named for its author. Isaiah himself wrote it. And his name means the Lord saves or Yahweh saves. His name is about salvation from God. And the book is about salvation. He lived and ministered in Jerusalem where he was the court preacher. Isaiah was evidently well educated. You can just tell from his book that he's very skilled in oration and writing. Um, and he was very well known uh, even though he wasn't always popular. Tradition holds that he was sawed in half during Manasseh's reign. Now tradition on this, his method of death, was so strong that uh, the Hebrew writer is believed to reference him in chapter 11, verse 37. I'm not a scholar by any means, but scholars do believe that he, the Hebrew writer, is talking about Isaiah when he says, of the prophets, verse 37, they were tempted, uh, destitute, afflicted, tormented, stoned, slain with the sword, and sawn in two. It's highly likely, they say, that that's a reference to Isaiah because tradition is just so strong that that's how he was executed. The book makes an obvious change from chapter 39 and 40 into the rest of the book. So there are two main divisions there. Uh, I said here in Arabic 2, liberal scholars question, and the joke is they always question everything, but liberal scholars question whether Isaiah wrote the rest of the book. And the primary reason is because they are very, very reluctant to making the step that would put them on a platform of having to accept divine inspiration because then the words that he said would be authoritative to live by and to look forward to Christ. But they don't want that. Uh, again, though, as you look at all of Scripture, Isaiah's prophecies were indeed written 700 plus years before Christ and are so precisely powerful that, like that one skeptic quoted or said, if authentic, would have to believe that they are of divine origin. Uh, letter C, the purpose of the book. Isaiah did three things. Isaiah rebukes Judah's leadership for seeking political security rather than trusting in the Lord. And how contemporary is that message to this day? It predicted the Babylonian captivity and Judah's return to their homeland. We often associate that with Jeremiah because he lived in that moment. But no, Isaiah did it as well. Isaiah also then looked beyond the immediate events and foretold of the coming of the Messiah, the reign of Christ. And we will see these three events unfolding or these purposes unfold as the book uh, go, continues. Brief note about the background. Isaiah had a long ministry, which began in the year King Uzziah died. And we know that's in 740 B.C., continued into the reign of Manasseh uh, during those years listed. But his ministry then extended the reign of four kings. This is so rare for one prophet to be there that long. You got Jotham, 
You can add this here, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. And his work covered 50 plus years. He ministered during a very critical time in Israel's history. Here are some key reminders. If he began prophesying at 740, now if you've memorized some of these dates, you're well on your way. If not, you're thinking, okay, which one's important, which one's not. If I'm not told which date's important, I'm not going to remember any date, right? But they're all relatively important. That's why I keep these charts. But looking at 740 B.C. to 690 B.C., that means he was known by both kingdoms, the north kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of, of Judah. But he was primarily called to prophesy to the southern kingdom there. And he lived during the time of uh, Israel's fall. He was there. He saw it happening. And he saw it coming. So that's impressive to me. He saw, or I should say his message to the southern kingdom after seeing this was stern and clear. He says to Judah, if you don't change your ways as well, you will have the same fate that befalls you. And sure enough, Largely, they went down that rebellious road, and it was 115 years later that that exactly would happen. Now, 115 years is a long time, but the same thing did happen. Although Isaiah was primarily called to the southern kingdom, comparatively, I want to make some distinctions, comparatively by key events, Isaiah lived through, through the fall of the northern kingdom, and Jeremiah lived through the fall of the southern kingdom. But they both had the same prophecy. And, of course, looking forward to the Christ. Comparatively by what they also said, Isaiah, like Jeremiah later, saw these people were not going to repent. And so he prophesied something that the faithful few would, would appreciate, hold on to as their identity and their hope. And that would help them through captive times. So the message of the same is one and the same. Return and restoration, return and restoration. At least you can have that to hold on to because God is faithful. God will send his Savior. We're under the same section now, main message of the book. Let me reword this, main message of the book. And it's one of stern rebuke. Now, a lot of the prophets have a message of stern rebuke and a plea for repentance. You're going to see this theme repeated time and time again. But that's what a prophet does. Get right, get right with the Lord. And it's usually called at a time when they need to hear it. Uh, social injustice was very commonplace. I want to tell you a little bit about the context of chapter 5. The context of chapter 5 is that wealthy people, not out of need but out of pure greed, are buying up all the land. And in the process, they are pushing the poor out of land rights. And the consequence of that leads to them not having even food, no place to live, nothing to eat. And God's message... Uh, through Isaiah is one of moral clarity. That's not right. Quit it. Stop it. As a matter of fact, even more so, instead of oppressing the poor, help the poor and the widows. And that message reminds us very much of James chapter 1, verse 27 in the New Testament when it defines pure and undefiled religion, which is, and I want to quote this, read this, keeping yourself unspotted from the world while attending to the orphans and widows in their time of need and trouble. And you know, it's worthy to make note of this, that God's law, God's moral code, doesn't exactly change much, does it, throughout the millennia? Absolutely not. The message of the prophets are so often relating to the needs of the day because of how people are. So the primary matter is looking to the Lord, making sure you're right with Him. And if you have that heart that wants to be right with the Lord, so many other things fall in place as they should. But when the heart's not right, you have all these problems and the need for God to call a prophet to get them back if they but listen. But like you heard in the video, largely unfaithful they were, um, they, they fail eventually. Uh, politically speaking, what's the context of Jerusalem? It's just a cauldron of political interests. Uh, you have kings of Judah that quit trusting in the Lord, quit seeking his will, and were making alliances with ungodly nations, and also seeking counsel from ungodly pagan prophets. Uh, it was not good. And all of this was fueled by a rebellious heart, love for money, and their social injustice that's running amok in Isaiah's day. So he had a hard, hard job to, uh, to do. But as if all that wasn't enough, 
What are the priests? I mean, do, do, aren't there still priests doing their job? Well, yes, no. I mean, they're in position, but they're not doing their job. The priests and the prophets were also corrupt. You can read about that in chapter 56. The people were not living right. They did not want to hear God's word, and so none of them were proclaiming it. No, no punishment, no slapping on the wrist. They weren't even trying. But Isaiah did not hold back. He even exposed those who were preaching a pleasing message. He says, they just want your money, and they want more power. Again, is that not what's happening today? Isaiah's message to the people is the same and to, both, to, to all classes. He says, get right with the Lord. It's a plea for repentance and a plea for a transformed life by a transformed heart. So yes, it's a critical time in Israel's history. Uh, God's people are not living godly. God's words are being ignored, and yet God always sends his people his message at critical times. And it's left up to them what they will do. So what will they do? Here's a key verse that I'd like to read to you. You can write the essence of it now or later or every word as you desire. But here's the key verses I like. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Again, when you read this, it's a lot like James 1, 7. Isaiah pleads with them to, here it is, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Uh, the NIV words it this way in verse 16 and 17a, wash and make yourselves clean, uh, put your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do what's right. Is that not a message the world needs today? Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right and care about that. For the outline, I know there's a lot of details there. Uh, this is a, a section that I sometimes skip, sometimes won't. But I want to help you in the margin of your uh, notes to write something that will be much easier. This is a simpler structure for you. And there's not going to be much on the screen to write, so you have plenty of space, I hope. But I just want to give you four events, four events to write in the margin here. And this will help you keep the bulk of the content easier to study as you read those uh, chapters or those key chapters. You can just write down here event number one. Chapter 6, event number 1, chapter 6, the calling. And this is so unique and significant that I'm going to spend the key theme on on just a moment. But event number 1 is the calling of him to prophesy. Event number 2, from chapters 7 through 12, you have here the sino ephraimitic War. That's a big term. What's that mean? Well, here's what you need to know. <laughs> uh, see, did I spell it right on the screen? Yes, I think so. The... Um, the Sino means Syria, and Ephraim means Israel, primarily the northern kingdom. So, Syria and the northern kingdom. Who, they both believe that they can form an alliance against Syria. An alliance against Assyria. Their forces combined wouldn't be 120th in this case. But here is where it gets interesting. This Sino-Ephraimitic alliance sends an invitation to join to the southern kingdom of Judah. To King Ahaz at the time. Ahaz has enough sense to decline. He said, that's not going to be good. They've got to be mad. Uh, in fact, they were mad. They got mad. They got angry, and they threatened King Ahaz in southern kingdom there, that if you don't join us, we'll uh, attack you. Well, God says, don't worry about them. I'll protect you. But sadly, Ahaz makes a mistake, motivated by maybe anxiety or fear, or just being a human, and some would say even doubt. Yes, doubt because he preemptively goes to Assyria and makes a pact for his protection. Well, God says, that's a bad move. You didn't trust me, Ahaz, and the consequence of your actions drawing attention to you will be that Assyria also devastates your land, and they did. So that's an, a key event that covers all those chapters. It will help you to have that in your mind uh, as you listen to that. Chapter 12, event number 3, chapter 12. This is 20 years later. Think about that. 20 years after the event I just described. Th these people are like big bullies. They come back every now and then. Uh, 20 years later, write the word Sargon, the name Sargon. He's now the Assyrian king when a little westward, a westward Philistine city named Ashdod rebels. And Ashdod seeks an alliance with both Egypt and the Jews. 
Isaiah says, in my words, don't be stupid. Don't align yourself with the Philistines in this. This is not good. Say no. And thankfully, this is impressive, Judah's king during this time was good king Hezekiah. And that distinction good was certainly exceptional. Most of them were bad. But good king Hezekiah listened to Isaiah's counsel, and, which was given in notable fashion. This was interesting. Isaiah, in order to counsel the king in this way and the people, he pantomimed. He acted out the message. And it wasn't uncommon for prophets to do this, but it was unique to prophets so often that when they did it, it was effective. It drew attention to them. Isaiah dressed in a wretched, decrepit, slave uh, outfit for days, and he acted out being miserable, hungry, and poor. And before turning the people's attention uh, to the words that he would then say after, after his behavior was noticed. He said, have you seen how I've been? That's how the whole nation will be if you join Ashdod against Sargon in, of Assyria. And Hezekiah's decision to listen to Isaiah spared the nation. Now they would have opportunities in the future to still go wrong, but in that moment, what would history have been? That decision, good King Hezekiah, spared the nation for the next 105 years because of how we know when it fought, failed. But that was a good decision. And oh, the importance of good leadership. Event number four. Event number four. Chapters 36 and 37. Ten years later, another decade went by, and you have the Assyrians again being bullies to them again. Uh, 701 B.C. Sennacherib. Sennacherib. He's the commander of the Assyrian army, and Assyria is uh, wanting to threaten to destroy them. And... Thankfully, Hezekiah is still the king at this point. And this is the account where in history we have two recorded documents of it. One, we have the biblical account, which is inspired, of course. And we have also the recorded history of Assyria, Sennacherib himself. This is so interesting. Sennacherib records his event of him going to try to take over Israel down there, or southern kingdom. And he, had, uh, he says he has those Israelites hemmed in, trapped in, and helpless. And then... Well, he doesn't say anything else. He just stops right there in hopes that history records or assumes the victory, but the Bible completes the story. Hezekiah knew that he was outnumbered and that there was nothing else he could do to stop them. He also did the one thing that he knew he could and knew that he should. He solicited help from the ultimate power source. He solicited help from God in prayer. You may have often heard the phrase, like Hezekiah's prayer. Oh, I love it. Here's the backstory to this. How we can wonder how often history would have been far different without the prayers of the godly. Hezekiah prayed for, for the Lord to, to help. And later that night in Sennacherib's camp, an angel of the Lord wiped out 185,000 enemy soldiers. And that's not exactly something that Sennacherib uh, in Assyria would want to document. That's just not something that they would be interested in doing. That's a failure. So however this happened, however the angel of the Lord destroyed them, however that took place, Sennacherib woke up and realized he was, must be in the wrong place, wrong time, because all his army's dead and decided to go back home. Knowing these four events will help you largely process all the content of Isaiah. So here are the key themes that will conclude the next ten minutes of the class. Prophecy. Prophecy. It's so rich in prophetic and messianic prophecy. Um, gave you some examples there where it's just incredible. Men the mentioning of Cyrus by name as being the one that would allow the Jews to return home. This was, this was 150 years before the event would happen. Long before Babylon was even a world power. Long before Cyrus was even a thought. But God knew. Incredible. Incredible. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 18 lists for us there, verse 21 and 22... The key standard for judging if a prophecy is from God. If, it's, if it comes true, it was from God. And again, every prophecy in Isaiah was spot on. Spot on. Here are some extra slides for you that came from a resource that Ron gave me, actually. Uh, he gave me a lot of vertical files, paper documents, and uh, I came across one sheet that's just perfect for tonight. I'm not going to cover all this, obviously, but you can screenshot and study it later. Three uh, screens for you. This is the first of three listing 
the, uh, pro, uh, the sightings in Isaiah where he prophesies, the New Testament citations where they were referenced and fulfilled, and the desired subject matter of, of their fulfillment. This is screen one, that's screen two, and that is screen three. As you can see, Isaiah writes a whole lot about the coming Messiah. But in all of this, here's a key theme that I'd like to focus on for our time tonight. The holiness of God. The holiness of God. In its root word, holy, it carries the idea of separate or set apart. Very close to the word sanctified. But more than any other writer, Isaiah addresses the holiness of God. The key expression, holy one of Israel, is found 25 times in the book itself. Only six times elsewhere throughout the whole Old Testament. So here's my rhetorical question. Did he have some kind of event that would make him leave, want to mention that often or would leave a lasting impression of the holiness of God? Absolutely he did. The nature of his very calling, that's what did it. Chapter 6, we'll notice. Turn to chapter 6 and we'll notice a few key things here about Isaiah. He is so impressed with what would change our lives as well. Verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Now remember, this is a time of, of upheaval. The king had just died when he began his work. So, so who rules Israel? I'll tell you who rules Israel. God still rules. So that's an emphasis there to draw your attention to. He is high and lifted up. He is exalted, extolled on his throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah is being allowed by vision to enter the throne room of God. And we can only try to imagine what that's like. That's the only way I guess he could have seen it and lived. Verses 1 through 3. Again, picking up where we left off. It says, Above the throne stood seraph. And each one had six wings. With two that covered his face. Uh, their face. With two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. They're saying how holy the Lord is to one another because they, they can't even look upon Him. Now think about this. Anytime something is triplicated, uh, it's accentuated to the max. So what's being emphasized to the ultimate the holiness of God. You can't get more holy than the indescribable holiness of God himself. And think of it like this. Not even the seraphs felt worthy to put their feet on the floor of the throne room. Because with two wings they're, they're staying aloft. With two they're covering humbly so their feet. And with two they're covering their eyes. They can't even look upon God's holiness. And these are among the highest of the angels or angelic beings. Look at verse 4. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And every time the Lord spoke, the door nearly fell off the hinges, and the house was filled with smoke. What was Isaiah's reaction? A lot like ours would be. Verse 5. So, so I said, Woe is me, I am undone. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So while in God's presence, Isaiah is contrasting the glory, the glory and the majesty and the sheer wonder and awe of God to the wretchedness of his own sin. And Isaiah is... And I think the word humble is too mild here. He is utterly undone. I mentioned earlier that we need to have an Isaiah 6 moment. And a lot of people need that in this world. Anyone who thinks too highly of themselves, too arrogantly of Christ's sacrifice, too little of God's holiness and grace, need to benefit from that Isaiah 6 moment. When Isaiah clearly saw God's glory, in contrast to himself, he fell prostrate on the ground, prays for mercy, and knows that his soul... Knows in his soul that he is ruined, and he just says, woe is me. So the story, thankfully, doesn't stop there. Something truly marvelous takes place. The great and holy God allows Isaiah's sins to be atoned for. Look at verse 6. Then, the one, then one of the seraphs flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which had been taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. A lot of symbolism here, of course. But below... He said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. 
Here's my thought question to guide our uh, focus. How do you suppose this event influenced Isaiah's understanding of God's grace? How do you suppose this event influenced Isaiah's understanding of God's grace in light of God's holiness? I think tragically a lot of people today don't want to focus on God's holiness. They feel that it makes him too distant and even would argue that it de-emphasizes his grace, which is a, 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 a rationale that makes no sense in my mind because, here's a key point I'm wanting to stress, it's not until we begin to have a rudimentary understanding of God's holiness that we will begin to appreciate and see just how great the gift of God's grace truly is. It's because God is so holy that we need His grace, and it is because of God's holiness that He is able to justify us and purify us. The holiness of God affects how serious we see sin, and the seriousness of sin affects how jubilant we are after being forgiven. So Isaiah's experience of God's glory and grace forever changed his perspective of servitude. And he knew that he was a goner were it not for God's mercy. And then being saved, then being forgiven, he responds to that grace. It compels him to say, here I am, Lord, commission me to serve in your holy cause. And that's the, the transition that everyone should experience when they have an Isaiah 6 moment in terms of reading the scriptures, of course, and realizing God is holy and they need forgiveness. Verse 8, verse 8. Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. It's beautiful, beautiful transition there. The holiness of God does not negate the saving and redeeming spirit of God. But Isaiah, his very name means God will save. And he refers to God as your redeemer, your redeemer. Um, and that's exactly who will redeem Israel, the Holy One of Israel, if they but repent. So, the servant of the Lord is the last theme, and I know that we have very little time left.